webinars uh, to highlight some of the um, activities and research going on with the group. Um, today we're gonna we have three uh, we're targeting seven to eight minute presentations with hopefully a minute or two of questions at each end of each for three total and that will give us to our half hour of kind of a brief intense update so I'd like to lead off with uh, Mike he's got his uh, uh, presentation up here Mike Fackler is a student at Ohio State University and uh, led this team wasted opportunities to a OSU specific um, smart campus challenge Mike I'll let you take it away and talk more about it and show what's going on here. Great, yeah, can everyone hear me? Yes, great. Fantastic, okay, so um, like Brian said, I, I led the Waste Opportunities team. I'm just gonna take you through the pitch. We're gonna run through it real quickly. Uh, there's a couple of animations. I should keep it under eight minutes, but um, kind of roll through it here. So we start off with a big question, uh, kind of posing uh, food insecurity in Franklin County, so um, you know, how, when you woke up this morning, did you have to deal with uh, uh, kind of figuring out where your next meal is coming from? Then we posed all the statistics. Uh, about a third of Franklin County has experienced food insecurity. 40% of food in America has gone to waste. So we really don't have uh, a food shortage. We have a food access and distribution problem. And we presented this as the first step in a, towards a solution. So this is our actual process. So I'll, I'll let this play because this is actually quite fun to watch. Great. So that's the that's the video. It's quite fun to watch. Still love watching it. This is our team. Uh, we did a collaboration with the Smart Campus uh, student organization on campus, which which they are just like Smart Columbus, where they're kind of driving data. Uh, they're using data to drive sustainability solutions. Uh, and so we have a data management problem here. So our first uh, kind of prompt is that we have a transportation problem because whenever it rains or it's too cold or there's unscheduled maintenance, we can't use the gem car that you saw in the video. Uh, because we can't let food get wet or um, uh, you know if we don't have a gem car we really can't collect around campus so our solution that we posed was this new gem car which just has heating so uh, the, the cold weather is taken out of the, the uh, factor here uh, and it protects the food in the back with a, a, a big box um, so, so we, we never will have to deal with uh, the uh, rain problems or the snow problems anymore other thing we have a data management problem here um, so this is what you're seeing right now is the process that we go through on a daily basis when we're collecting the data um, real kind of um, mean and hungry here, but it's um, it's a real manual process. Uh, and, and so we, this is the actual process, this, this picture here, uh, we, we take it on our phones and then we, we put an Excel sheet. Um, there's a lot of mismatched data here and we can't really do it in the weather uh, because of the uh, concerns uh, with uh, food safety. Um, and so and you can't open up the bags because of food safety, right? So uh, we have a lot of, uh, Un unscheduled items or something that we might not know how much of exactly and so we have a lot of we have about a 35 percent data loss rate um, so our solution here this is the smart campus uh, platform that we proposed I'll kind of take you through it here um, yeah, very, so this is from dining services standpoint they can look at what food uh, is available they can favorite whatever items they see a lot of they can kind of select the item they click add uh, they get quantities um, and then once the quantities are given, it's taken to the summary screen, screen so they can either edit or they can submit the order. As soon as the order is submitted, it gives them a little button that says success, and then um, they're able to kind of see where their current donations are uh, in, in the universe. Um, and, and then, uh, so this is, the, this is the second portion of this application. Um, 
work here. Oh, why does it work? Come on. Okay, so this is the second portion. This is um, uh, this is again. Uh, this is from our side. So we get the request. Uh, the Food Recovery Network gets the request at um, you say Tuesday at nine thirty. Uh, we're able to kind of schedule and assign those to drivers um, and and pickers and give a drop off location as well. Um, and then uh, we're able to kind of see oh it's out for delivery. And then once the delivery is completed by the driver, uh, we are able to click on that completed drive and then see the actual summary of items accepted, uh, what, what has been denied. So our order efficiency, we lost 4% of the food because it wasn't accepted by the food bank and based off of caloric data that we fed six families. So that's kind of the purpose of this uh, application. And then we're able to, from our side, we're able to see where everyone's at, what's completed, what's not completed. So we're able to more efficiently um, schedule out those drivers. So then Really exciting part of all this is that all of that inventory data that they have to enter into that system to get a, a recovery is then put into this analytics dashboard. So we're able to kind of give them a, a viewpoint of, hey, you know, on a week, on a month, on a year, on an all-time basis, in Terabyte Cafe, in a, in a category of bagels, in a subcategory of blueberry, chocolate, and whole wheat, these are your quantity trends. So they're able to kind of look at their trends and, and uh, have a better idea for demand forecasting, demand planning, uh, kind of what, um, what needs to be uh, changed up to, to reduce their waste. Uh, we, have, we, we then also give them the top five foods by quantity, the top five pantries from families fed, and then ultimately long-term here, uh, once we have a better idea on campus of what food waste actually is, we wanna be able to kind of give our percentages of, of uh, diversion rates uh, through donation. Um, Here's a kind of total summary of, of each uh, of the total program, right? So we've got KSA, Berry, Oxys, all these different places on campus, the certain kinds of foods that are going to waste, the pounds, the, the total uh, dollars recovered from a, from a sticker standpoint, and uh, the, the uh, families fed with that food from the floor value again. This is a really exciting part. Um, they have built-in margins of over procurement uh, just to beat their business model. Uh, and so we're going to be able to give them, based off of their uh, margin of overproduction or over procurement, we're going to be able to compare those to what we're donated uh, and, and actually give them real-time feedback. Hey, you know, we're, we're, over, um, we're over producing consistently by 1%. If we knock that out, we have the safety net that we know we can reach. Um, and, and so we're reducing waste on the front end and back end, and also the procurement and production costs as well. So it's quite interesting. This is just kind of a visualization of how it all works. Dining Services gives us their information. We receive their information. And ultimately, we'd like to have the community partners as well be able to select and pick um, what, what they can use. So if we've got 15 Italian subs, and we know that Starhouse can only take 10 of those uh, 15 subs, and the, the other five are going to go to waste, then... We want to be able to know that so we can get those other five subs somewhere where it's actually going to be eaten and, and not go to waste. So we kind of went into uh, different campus sustainability goals, uh, kind of did it on a per dollar invested basis. Um, so for every dollar invested, this will uh, increase our, our meals donated by three and a half. Uh, and that's enough to feed 1.2 people a day. Uh, and then from a waste standpoint, a one dollar is the equivalent of 2.33 pounds recovered, which is loosely seven and a half uh, uh, pounds of uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, avoided. Um, these are all of our collaborators. We're working with Land Grant uh, to try to get some bagel beer going, which would be really neat. Um, but ultimately, this is uh, a group of our collaborators. These are our next steps. Best Food Forward is a really great organization on campus. They do bulk buying of food, uh, of produce specifically, and they give um, students a discounted rate on, on produce, so it's affordable. Uh, and um, they, we just did our first pickup with them. Uh, we got a ton of good uh, fresh produce taken to some food banks around here that have kitchens. Uh, so they're able to then give these uh, to people who might not have fresh produce or fresh vegetables in their life, uh, these, these, these good fresh vegetables and produce. So these are our long-term goals. Uh, and then ultimately five years out, uh, conservatively, we're looking at 187,000 meals donated, which is the equivalent of right around 390 pounds of CO2 avoided. So, um, that was the end of our presentation, and, and uh, we won $54,000, which is very cool. Uh, that $54,000 of that, uh, will, $24,000 will go towards that gem car I showed you earlier. $30,000 of that will go towards the, uh, the data management platform, uh, which Dining Services at OSU is very excited about, and I'm sure Brian and, and Co. is very excited about as well, because it'll give us some more uh, accurate data as to our donations and, and all of that stuff. So 
a really cool process, uh, super amped about it. Uh, it. It will be a great thing for OSU and for food waste in general uh, to be able to kind of manage these trends better. And, uh, Tell them what else on. you won, Mike. What's that? Tell them what else you won. Well, uh, we're also going to Paris uh, for, for a week, uh, uh, thanks to NG, uh, uh, because uh, I, I don't really know what we're doing there. I think we're either giving an award, uh, we're either getting an award for campus uh, innovation or uh, we're giving a presentation on the actual uh, process. So it's, it'll be very neat for sure. It's cool to get that recognition and it'll be right back, be brought right back to, uh, to, the, to the university. So uh, Great. We have time for a quick question or two for Mike as he uh, unshares his screen so that uh, again, you can get ready with hers. Any questions from the group for Mike? Mike, Mike. yeah, this is Mike Wong. Mike, uh, is there any of, are there any of your partners who are on the health end of this issue in terms of being able to assess the health benefits of what you're doing in terms of feeding hungry people? No, we haven't. We haven't gotten that far. Uh, you know, ultimately, this data okay. platform will uh, will be able to cal like, uh, calculate for every item the nutritional value. So once we get that rolling, I'm sure that we can bring in some sort of nutrition uh, partner uh, to kind of give a value from that standpoint. But as of right now, we don't have uh, a, a nutrition partner. Okay, thank you. Is there one more burning question out there for Mike? <clears throat> If there's one for later, please feel free to email and we can connect you with Mike offline as well to answer that. Yes, I, I have to run. Uh, we have a meeting actually pertaining to this uh, and, and, and the group members just showed up. So I do have to run. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, it's fantastic. I can't wait for the next call. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Bye. And a quick reminder for folks to go ahead and mute their screens, <clears throat> their, their, uh, their um, uh, microphones, um, and I'll turn it over to Someone from our Southern contingent, uh, Danny, along with Corby at LSU. Go ahead, Danny, take it away. Brian, can you hear me uh, clearly now? Hello. Yeah, we can Hi. hear you. Oh, okay, great. So, so uh, I'm going to present the work Brian and I have been working with John and Corby from Pennington Bell Medical Research Center in Louisiana State University. So the work is uh, about the selection, intake, and the play with patterns of leftover items from a pilot study with U.S. consumers. Um, so, so following many ambitious national uh, food waste reduction goals, there are many food waste policies and the initiatives uh, encourage consumers to keep foods and the food ingredients that are unused after the meal preparations or um, finished of the meal uh, to help reduce the household food waste, uh, help reduce household food waste and, uh, and the consumer food waste. But in the existing literature, uh, there are very limited knowledge about those leftovers, especially about the consumption and the creations of those leftovers. Uh, we believe to better guide the food waste reduction strategies, it will be very important to understand the role of those leftovers on helping the households uh, reducing food waste. So collaborate with uh, uh, Pennington's uh, Corby and John, we recruit 18 adults from Baton Rouge, Louisiana area um, to ask them collect the very detailed information about their food selection, food intake, and the play waste during one week in their free living conditions. Um, so, so basically, this free living conditions includes all times of the day, uh, weekends as well as weekdays, and the food at home as well as the food away from home. Uh, we ask our participants to record those information based on a smartphone app called as Smart Intake. Um, the subjects are required to take the pictures of, their, uh, of the food before and after they eat anything. Um, we also ask the subject to note if this particular item uh, was a leftover from previous meal uh, or if this unfinished item were saved for later use as a leftover. Um, after the participant collect those information, uh, the smart intake can automatically upload those information to our server and the data were analyzed, analyzed the following uh, remote food photography method, uh, which has been uh, previously described and validated by Corby and John. Um, 
So, so here is uh, information about our 18 participants. Um, all of them came from Baton Rouge, Louisiana area. Most of them are female. Uh, the average age is higher than the uh, average US consumer, while we have a pretty balanced weight, height, and a BMI compared to the US average. Um, during that one week, our 18 uh, <coughs> participants, they had 307 meal uh, and a 41 snacks. <coughs> Mm, among those 300 meals, uh, only 12% of those meals featured at least one leftovers. But as long as there, uh, there is one leftover selected, uh, around 80% of the calorie from that meal came from leftover. So it looks like our subjects, they intentionally planned on leftover meals. They either had no leftover at all, or they had a, a, a meal uh, with most of the calorie coming from leftover. Um, and also among those 300 meals, uh, we analyzed the occasions with unconsumed items. We found that only 20% of the, uh, the meals with unconsumed items generate any leftover. And 25% uh, uh, of the snacks uh, of those unconsumed snacks will generate any leftover. So it looks like our subjects, uh, they were not very used to saving food for later use. Uh, we also analyzed their food behaviors at a food item level. During that one week, um, they selected 1,177 food items. Um, and 12% uh, of them were leftover, which accounts to uh, around 10% of the total selected calories. Leftover selection varied by the types of the food. Zero meat and the vegetable were more likely to be selected as a leftover and the leftover selection varied by time. Um, our participants were more likely to select that leftover on Monday for their lunch. Uh, we also found some interesting gender patterns about the leftover selections. Um, we found compared to the male, uh, females, they were less likely to select the leftovers. Um, consistent with the existing literature where researchers find that older people tend to care more about food waste, we found elder pe compared to the younger ones, uh, our older subjects, they were la more likely to select leftovers. Uh, we also analyzed the creation of, the, those, uh, of those leftovers. Um, among, among the items that were not fully consumed, uh, only around 24% of the those items uh, were saved for later use. This accounts to only 28% of the unconsumed uh, food items. Um, the creation of the leftover does not vary by uh, food type significantly, but we do find our participants were less likely to save uneaten food for later use during the weekend and the following Monday. Um, to better understand the association between uh, the creation and uh, the consumption of the leftover and the food waste and the food consumption behaviors. We developed the following models where the, the types of food and the eating occasions were controlled in the model, individual fixed effects and the study day fixed effect were included. Um, we found out that um, it looks like our participants, they don't like leftover that much. Uh, when this food item is a leftover, uh, it's more likely to generate some play waste. But the existence of the leftover could have uh, spillover effects on the other items from this meal. Um, for example, if, uh, if the participant served himself a chicken uh, on plate A, that chicken is surrounded by freshly prepared green bean. Uh, on plate B, the chicken is surrounded by uh, leftover green beans. And then we found that the chicken uh, is less likely to be wasted uh, and a smaller proportion of the chicken will be wasted when the, that chicken is surrounded by leftover green beans. We also found the decision about uh, saving for later use will also have impacts on the other items. Um, for example, uh, uh, the participant served himself uh, spaghetti, garlic bread, and a green salad. Smaller proportion of the green salad will be wasted if the participant determines to save the spaghetti for later use. And an even smaller proportion of that green salad will be wasted if the participant determines to save both spaghetti and the garlic bread for later use. 
um, consistent with the existing literature, we found uh, when the particip participants select uh, uh, more food at the beginning, it tends to generate uh, more food waste and uh, consume more. And also, less, uh, less proportion of the food will be wasted if the, the food is, uh, is uh, uh, high energy intensity, has a pretty high energy intensity. So to sum up, we found the leftovers selected by the sample, by our participants were most frequently vegetables, cereals, and meats. And uh, uh, our participants were more likely to select the leftovers on Monday for their lunch. Um, they were less likely to save the uneaten food for later use during the weekends uh, and the following Mondays. Uh, leftover have spillover effect on the another item for that meal, as long as the subject identify uh, more item on the plate that they intend to save for later use, then they will focus on this particular item and the way generate less food waste. Uh, we want to note that uh, we should be cautious about those results because this is a pilot study with only 18 participants, with most of them being female, and all of them uh, came from the same location uh, in the US. Uh, also, currently we do not have the information about the the initial food inventory and uh, whether the saved for later used item were actually consumed later. Uh, those should be uh, the, some interesting research we, we can conduct in the future. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, any questions? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, if not, um, fascinating work. We're still uh, we're interested to see. Go ahead. Hi, Denji. This is Sam Hill. Um, maybe I missed that. What counts as one leftover? So, uh, so I think in here we we use the the gram and the calorie to to measure okay. the quantity, quantity of the 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 leftover. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I believe it referred to like the standard serving size per the USDA. Yeah. If uh, people have other questions for Danny, feel free to, to email. Um, we'll get you connected with her to answer her questions. Uh, can people see my screen now? Yeah, okay. Well, I want to share with you some work that we had done in partnership with, with uh, Refed and uh, thanks to Ashwarya and Denny who are on the call as well. <clears throat> and uh, Denny also gave some great input for this as well. We work with Jackie uh, Suggett and Carolyn uh, Powell at Refed and Katie Bender as well here at OSTU. Um, here we're trying to dig into date label phrases and kind of <clears throat> how they affect intended discard. And Refed has noted that standardizing food date labels, they, they suggest as being one of the most promising avenues for reducing food waste in homes by consumers. <clears throat> There's been some policy action in this space. There were proposed a federal legislation um, that was received positively but never made it out of committee. Uh, FSIS of USDA issued some guidance <clears throat> um, uh, for companies that have started to uh, embrace that as well as industry guidance from the Food Marketing Institute and the Grocers Manufacturing Association um, <clears throat> urging their uh, companies to use use by if the uh, food date label has some safety element to it and best if used by if it's merely a quality issue that surrounds that product. <clears throat> um, and some firms are changing their labels and seeking to quantify those credits towards their sustainability goals. Um, <clears throat> we work with them to look at a couple of questions. What's the role of different phrases on that discard decision? Would an education campaign <clears throat> around those date labels, uh, change that, and what other avenues might exist to reduce consumer food waste related to these date labels. We had three elements to this study. One was an in-person between subjects design here at OSU uh, in, in the Columbus lab with the sensory lab and Chris Simons and his group, looking at several real life packages that we manipulated the dates on there. Uh, we then took this online. We took pictures of all those products that people saw in person, 
and posted those on a national online study to get a, <clears throat> a national group and basically replicated that lab study. And then we did another national online study where we changed up the way we asked questions to get a more of a within subject design. So they saw multiple products <clears throat> with multiple dates assessing their intended discard as we changed the date phrase <clears throat> and the actual dates. For example, here is one example survey page. People saw the cereal product, they saw the whole label, and then they're asked, <clears throat> If this package were in your home and you're deciding whether to keep it or discard it, uh, what would you do if the date were this, best before 16 March, best before 25 January, et cetera? <clears throat> then they would click on keep, not sure, or discard one per row. This gave us some very granular information about exactly when they would pull that trigger and go from the keep to the discard column. Just walking you through one set of results that are kind of it's typical here. <clears throat> um, sell by is a very common phrase observed on clamshell lettuce. Um, we find here um, that for one day past that date, about 40% of the national respondents said that they would intend to discard that product. If you change the phrase to best if used by, not a lot of change. Best if used by is the preferred FMI GMA phrase for this product. Um, again, one day past, changing the phrase, not a big difference. Expires on, though, that's a phrase that does drive up intended discard by about five uh, percentage points. And so expires on seems to be a sensitive phrase that does invoke <clears throat> a bit of different intentions. However, if you add some uh, information about labeling, so we gave them made them read some information about the label phrases and what they mean. They even took a quiz about this. It does in decrease the intended discard for two of the three phrases. Um, and it's the strongest effect for the FMI GMA phrase, about five percentage points or about a 12% improvement in the intended discard <clears throat> for this product. But the biggest change actually comes from just changing the actual number of days remaining. <clears throat> so if you go from uh, one day past the label date to being on the label date, the green bar here shows uh, basically cutting in half the intended discard <clears throat> for most of these uh, phrases. And that's even without any additional um, education or quizzes on what the date labels mean. And it's very unlikely that the quality of the product is going to degrade by half <clears throat> in one additional day on the date horizon. And when we did this with other products, we found some very similar trends. Expires on is a really uh, touchy phrase. It drives higher intended discard than other phrases. Sell by is the next highest. Um, there's little systematic difference across other phrases other than those two. Education tends to lower intended discard anywhere from a percentage point up to five percentage points, depending upon the exact product. We looked at five different products. But days are the big movers. Going from the day before to the day of is about an 8 percentage point to a 15 percentage point change in intended discard. Going from day of to day after, anywhere from a 10 percentage point to a 27 percentage point change in the intended discard. So our takeaways are that standardizing date label phrases will have some benefit particularly if you can get the expires on and sell by off the date labels, we think there'll be a nice little bump <clears throat> in reducing kind of intended discard. And of course, having the same phrase will really help anchor a more effective education campaign um, because we do find that <clears throat> uh, that education treatment did improve. But the biggest thing could be the private firm policies concerning just how many days they put on products seem to be the largest potential source of change and discard. Um, <clears throat> if companies feel comfortable adding a day or two onto that date horizon for certain products, particularly the shelf stable ones, um, <clears throat> where there probably is very little uh, noticeable degradation in quality from adding a day or two uh, of life to that product, uh, could really potentially be a big mover. But future research would, is needed to kind of assess that downside from shifting date horizons on purchase and discard patterns. Because here we're only looking at discard and it may have some issues for purchase intent as well that we don't want to be cognizant of. So 
those are kind of our takeaways. I'll pause there for questions because we're right at time. A burning question from the group. If not, feel free to email. Um, we'll be working with this data extensively. I saw you just to show you just a sliver of that today and uh, uh, developing some journal articles out of this. <clears throat> uh, Danny's work is a, also in journal article format and under review as we speak. And um, Mike's project is going to be ramping up here the next few weeks. So glad that you We have, um, they had about three that we could share today. There's probably about another half dozen to 10 more that we could share and hope to share in future webinars with you all as well. So thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> Feel free to email if you have questions or opportunities. Uh, lots of exciting things going out there. Hopefully some of you on the call will be involved in Kroger's next round of Zero Hunger, Zero Waste. Um, <clears throat> and lots of exciting opportunities around the nation to uh, reduce food waste and do something positive with that and uh, make an impact. So thanks all for joining and look forward to connecting with you the next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.